Go ahead and take a seat, and as you're sitting down, take your Bibles or your apps, whatever you read on, and turn to Romans chapter 12. Now, if you're in a Bible, Romans is in the New Testament, so go like two-thirds back. Uh, you're looking for Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, then Romans. If you get into the Corinthians, you've gone too far. So, as you're turning there, uh, let me point out the obvious. Football season has begun. Um, <laughs> nah. Um, but I want you to know in saying that, that you need to know our Lake Havasu High School football team, the Knights, beat Yuma last Friday 49-0. to zero. So uh, they won the game previous to that also. So uh, if you're not making plans to uh, go see our uh, Knights play football, you may want to reconsider because apparently our team's pretty good this year. Uh, so go check them out. I also realize that as I make the sweeping statement that football uh, season has begun, many of you, as I made that statement, the clouds opened up and a light shone down and an angel started singing and you were praising the Lord because football season had started. But some of you in this room, as I made that statement, went, oh Lord, not again. I don't know that I can make it through another season. God, help me. Give me the strength. Give me the patience. Uh, but I hope this morning, I've got a story for you, and I hope that this story will be entertaining enough that whether you like football or not, you'll enjoy it. Um, it's my football story, and so what I want you to do is imagine me as a sophomore in high school. I had hair back then. I actually had long hair for a Texas panhandle boy. Um, I was five foot zero, literally the smallest male in my high school. I weighed 114 pounds. My, my sophomore year, I decided I'd go out for football. I'd always been too small to play football. And so sophomore year, I decided, you know what? I have five foot. I'm going to play. And so I went out for the football team. And two a day started, which if you don't know what that is, uh, two weeks, three weeks before school starts, uh, the football team starts practicing. They do it twice a day, which is why they call it two a days. Um, and it's an intensive practicing period to get them ready for the season. So a couple weeks before school, show up at the high school, I, I try out for the team, uh, they get my height, my weight, realize that I'm pathetically small, and get my equipment. You know, they, they give you your football pads and your helmet and all that stuff. The smallest pads they had stuck out about six inches on either side. Uh, our colors were red and white, and so white uh, jerseys and pants and a red helmet my helmet was so big that they had to special order extra fat padding to put in the helmet so it wouldn't jiggle around on my head. Basically, what I looked like was a midget triangle with a cherry on top. <laughs> that was me playing football. Um, so I was tiny, and my coach trained me and worked with me and tried to do the best that he could. As small as I was, I was still pretty fast, and so I had some uh, advantage there. But at my school, the way we did football was you do a few days of uh, two a days, and on the third day, we had a big scrimmage that the whole community came out to see, and it was called the Red and White Game. And it was basically the junior varsity, which I was part of, versus the varsity. The big guys. And so the end of the third day, we get ready to go out and play the red and white game. And this year, the particular year I started, uh, junior varsity, which was what I was part of, uh, started out on defense. And I was a corner, which meant I was back in the backfield and I would you know, run with the receivers and try and keep them from catching the ball. And if the running back got through the line, then I was the guy that was supposed to stop him, all that kind of stuff. And so my coach said, listen, Chad, you have one goal. There, there's one thing that you need to accomplish. Don't let anyone get past you. That's all you want, I want you to do is don't let anybody get past you. I said, okay, coach, I'll, I'll do that. And on the other side of the team, the varsity, was a guy named Andy Viverka. Now, Andy was six foot four. 250 pounds of solid muscle. For those of you who know like running stats and stuff, he ran the 40 meter in less than five seconds. That's faster than most professional NFL players. 
He had been scouted by, checked out by every major college football team within a 600-mile radius of my little small town. I mean, he was a big deal. We were ranked in the state of Texas because of Andy Viverka. Uh, I mean, he was amazing. He was basically a freight train with a football helmet on, okay? So, I kid you not, this is a true story. First play, I'm out on defense in my corner position, and they do a sweep play with Andy Viverka getting the ball. Andy Viverka comes along my side, plows through three guys. I mean, it was like watching a bowling ball go through bowling pins. I mean, they just kind of, he tossed them to the side. And he's heading towards me. And I am the only thing between Andy Viverka and the goal line. And I went, oh, crud, I'm in trouble. <laughs> Andy Viverka versus me. Who's going to win that one? I wonder. So... I remembered my coach telling me, Chad, you're a little guy. If you're going to go tackle someone, tackle them low because you're not going to be able to hit them in the chest and stop them because they literally weigh twice as much as you. And so Andy's coming towards me, and I kept thinking, hit him low, hit him low, hit him low. So I'm running towards Andy, and I go low, and I don't remember anything after that. (laughs) The next thing I remember is Coach Merrill standing over me going, Chad! Chad, wake up. How many fingers do you see? (laughs) Yeah, 16. And so basically what I found out is as I went low, Andy's knee went high right into my face, knocked me out cold. Like it wasn't even funny knocked out cold. But Andy Viverka is standing over me at this time and kind of laughing and smiling. And I, I looked up at Coach and I was like, what happened? And, you know, I'm wobbly and incoherent, and Coach goes, you stopped Andy Viverka. Yeah! (laughs) Sweet! I thought, wow, that's awesome. And Coach goes, yeah, he tripped over you as you fell. (laughs) So basically, Andy Viverka knocked me out and tripped as that was happening. But I was a hero on my team for like three days because I, I tackled The big guy on the team, the state guy, the guy that all the colleges want, I got him. I had one mission my coach gave me, and I accomplished that mission. I did it. It wasn't pretty, and I suffered a little bit as a result, but I did it. But as I say that, I had that one mission. And my question to you this morning is, what is your one mission? I would challenge you to think for just a second... I think that every one of us in this room has one thing that pretty much drives everything we do and say. Every thought, every decision, every action that we take, there's one thing that drives everything about us. For some of us, it's money. For some of us, it's uh, happiness. For some of us, it's power. But what should that one mission be? What should that one thing be in our life. Now here at Calvary, we had this same question about 10 or 15 years ago. We started looking at all of our ministries and and seeing what the church was doing and we realized we needed that one thing that kind of drove the whole bus. And so we sat down and started evaluating what does Christ call us? If we put all the traditions aside and just look at God's word, if we just analyze what God's word says and how Jesus did ministry, what would that one thing be? And ultimately, we came to the decision that that one thing for Christ and God's word is leading people to him. Think about it. Everything that Christ did, every time he healed someone, every time he preached, even when he hung on the cross, it was so that we could begin a relationship with him, right? And so we as Calvary sat down and realized this, and we came up with a statement that pretty much uh, summed up this. But before I get to that statement, let me throw this out to you. Paul had this same question thrown at him, and he answers the question in Romans 12. So look in your Bibles, Romans 12. We're going to start in verse 1. We're going to read verses 1 and 2. So Romans 12 Verses 1 and 2, it says this. 
I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So we looked at Jesus' ministry and realized that everything Jesus did was to point people to a relationship with him. And then Calvary said, okay, if that's our mission, then how do we word that? So here is Calvary's mission. It's very simple. To lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. I hope today that after I'm done, that you can walk out the doors and have a pretty good idea what our mission is. To lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. So we made the decision to make this our mission statement, to live out this mission. And we had to make some changes when we made that decision. We had to change some things about the way we did ministry here at Calvary. So One of the things that we changed is rather than just saying we wanted to partner and we wanted to work in the community, we started doing it. And so we started supporting schools and we started helping interagency and Haven House and we started going out into the community and doing things here in Havasu. And we noticed a change when we became intentional with approaching the community and showing the community what the love of Jesus looked like through serving them, things happened. For instance, our attendance increased. Since the point where we made this decision, our attendance has increased every year. Just since 2010, when I came on, in 2010, we were running about 800-ish people on a typical weekend. Fast forward to last year, that number went from 800-ish to 1,300-ish. We've increased our attendance, but attendance isn't really a good measure. It tells us a little bit, but we've also been baptizing like crazy. We have baptized more people than we did every year previous. So every year we've increased the number of people that we've been baptizing. Do you know that last year alone we baptized over 100 people? Isn't that amazing? That is life change in action. That, those are first time relationships with Jesus Christ. Those are brand new people that are going to get to go to heaven rather than condemn to hell. We also noticed that our life group attendance increased. Uh, we, we put a big emphasis on small groups here at the church because we believe that In order to step into life change and experience life change, that happens best when you're in a relationship with other believers. And that's what life groups are all about. And guys, if you're not aware of this, the life group tables are outside right now and available for signups. If you're not involved in a life group, go check out the tables because life change can happen in an amazing way when you surround yourself with other believers who are there to study God's word and live life together. So life group attendance went up, we, attendance went up, baptisms went up, but we were also serving in the community in a way that we had never done before. More people who were with Calvary were serving voluntarily in our community. We were making a difference by putting feet on the ground. Did you know also Calvary Baptist Church is one of the top giving churches in the state of Arizona Are you aware of that? We give, we are in the top tier of giving to this community, to this nation, and to international organizations that support missions. That says something. So we made some changes. We were intentional. Yeah, thank you. We made some changes, and at the time, there were people who didn't like those changes, But it's made Calvary the church it is today. This mission statement dictates everything that we are and believe. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to break down this mission statement and just talk about the parts of it. So part one is simply this. 
Calvary's mission is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ, right? That is why we exist. It is what we do. It's what we live for, is to lead people to that relationship. Christ commanded this in the Great Commission. If you go to Matthew chapter 28 uh, and, and go towards the end, Jesus is about to ascend into heaven and he gives them one last commission. And he says, go to the ends of the earth and make disciples. And it goes on, baptizing them, blah, blah, blah. But the, the focus of that passage, of that commission, is to make disciples. And so that's our mission, to go out and make disciples of people who were not disciples previously. So everything we do is centered around that. You may have noticed as you drove down the highway that there's a big new building being built kind of across the highway from Dairy Queen. That's our new building. And let me be blunt and step on your toes and kick you in the shin a little bit. That new building is not for you. That new building is for the 35 to 40,000 people in Lake Havasu City who do not know Christ. That new building is going to be super comfortable. You're going to walk in and go, oh, these seats are so cushy. No one's farted in them yet, so they still smell good. <laughs> There's going to be parking. Guys, you're not going to have to park two blocks away and walk in on a busy street. You're going to be able to park in a parking lot and walk to the building. It's going to be awesome. But that parking and those new seats and that building and the way it's decorated and the way it's designed and the way the services are going to go in that building are not for you. They're for the 35 to 40,000 people in this town who don't know Christ. So there are going to be some changes that come when we get in that new building and you're going to complain and we're going to go, don't care because it's not for you, it's for them. That sounds harsh, but that's the truth. You're here because you've already begun or you're thinking about beginning a life-changing relationship. But there are people who have not even started the process. And they've thought about coming here, but there's not enough seats. And they don't want to walk two blocks to get to uh, the church. And it's inconvenient, but the new church is going to open the door because it's going to be convenient. And it's going to be comfortable. And it's going to be easy to come. It's easy to see. It's closer to the middle of town. That new building is for them so that we can lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. And we want you to help us lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. So that new building is going to be amazing. And the services there are going to be amazing. But it's for them. So I've talked about the why you know, we, why we exist. We lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. But what about the how? How do we do it? Well, that's the second part of the mission statement. Calvary accomplishes this mission through the love of his people. The love of his people. When I was growing up, I didn't grow up in a Christian household. Uh, my parents were amazing. They were loving. They were awesome, but they were not believers. Um, And one of the things that kept them from wanting to go to church was these old methods of evangelism that were offensive. So, like, let me give you an instance. Uh, How many of you just love it when someone shows up in a suit at your door on Saturday morning? So why are we doing that? We don't. Here at Calvary, we adapt to the culture. Let me challenge you. Where does the Bible say, you shall go into your community door to door and knock on them? And ask people if they know Jesus. No. Actually, what did Christ do? Christ went to people where they were at on their terms. And he loved them in the state that they were in. Did he condemn sinners themselves? No. What's his famous statement? Neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. We're not called to go and offend people. That's... God's word is offensive enough, and it says so itself. We're called to be the hands and feet of Christ, to be the salt of this earth, to be the light of the world for people who are living in darkness. That's our job. I went to seminary, uh, seminaries uh, where us preachers go to get our master's degree, where we study old dead languages and uh, old books and things that would bore everyone in this room. But When I was in seminary, I had a professor in Christian ministry class 
who would tell me, it doesn't matter how many people you offend or how many people, as long as you are telling everyone that you encounter about Jesus, push it, push it, push it, push it. And I went, that, that, that doesn't sound right. Because it's that attitude that actually is keeping my mother from accepting Christ and going to church. So I would hear that, and it didn't set right with me. And then literally the very next day, I would go to my missions class, and my missions professor would say, in your, when you go out in a mission field, you first have to learn the language. So you have to be able to tell somebody about Christ if they're going to hear about Christ. And the second thing is you have to learn the culture and adapt your methods of ministry to that culture. So why do we approach Americans with this attitude of, well, this is the way we did it in the 50s and worked then, so we're going to continue to do it now even if it offends everyone we know, when in reality, we should be approaching Lake Havasu City as our mission field and saying, God, what about the culture do we need to adapt our methods so that we can be more relevant, so that we can be more appealing, so that people will want to hear us when we talk about Christ. And so that's what it means to love people. It means that we need to think about them. It's not about pushing an agenda or being a a salesman and making sure that you close the deal with that person. It's about loving them where they're at and letting the Holy Spirit do that work. It's not our job to convict somebody. It's our job to speak the truth lovingly and let the Holy Spirit convict them. And so we need to love people where they're at. We need to realize that that's what Christ did. So will you join with Calvary as we line up with the mission of Christ and love people in this community who don't know him? That's the first how. So we've talked about why we do what we do, what we do. It's leading people to a life-changing relationship with Christ. And we've talked about the first way we do that is through the love of his people. But let me be honest, love is not enough. And you go, wait, wait, what'd you say? Love isn't enough. Because Jesus not only loved people, but he spoke the truth in their lives. So the second way that Calvary accomplishes his mission in, here at Calvary is through the power of his truth. It's through the power of his truth. When I first came to Calvary five years ago, um, you know, I'm moving into a new house and I had to go to the Ace Hardware to get a new hose for my dryer and I had to go here to get this and we had to go get food to get groceries and all this stuff to stock the house. And what does everybody ask you when you're checking out? Oh, where are you from? Because no one's from Havasu. I mean, let's be real here. A handful of you are, but you're the oddballs. (laughs) No one's from Havasu. So the first question I would get is, oh, where are you from? And I'd say Texas. And they'd be like, great, what brings you to Havasu? And I would say, oh, I'm one of the new pastors at Calvary Baptist. And I heard over and over things like, oh, (laughs) I don't go there. They water down the gospel too much. Or they're too seeker sensitive for my taste. And being a graduate of one of the most conservative seminaries in the United States, that bothered me to my core. Because I could not work for a church where the truth was not being spoken boldly. And so the first three or four months that I worked here, I listened very closely and analyzed every sermon that Chad, Chet, and Sean preached. And I discovered something. Every church that I had attended as a kid and teenager in college uh, was a hellfire and brimstone type style. You know, here's your sin, 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 sin. You're a sinner, sinner, sinner. And bye, good job, go pray. But... I discovered something here at Calvary where we don't focus so much on the sin. We want to point out the sin, but our big concern is how to get out of that sin. I can't tell you how many sermons I would listen to when I was a kid or a teenager or whatever, and you'd go, okay, well, I'm a sinner and I'm guilty of this sin. Now what? What do I do about it? How do I get out of it? And that's what's the difference with Calvary. I think that's why some people think that we water down the gospel or whatever. We don't water it down. We focus on life change because that's the whole point of pointing out sin. It's so that we know what it is and how to get out of it. And so what I learned was not only do we speak the truth, but we speak the truth and give you a way to change your life and a way to recover and redeem. But also one thing I discovered is 
Calvary was the first church that I'd ever been in that was not afraid to talk about the difficult issues. You know what I mean? Those issues that other churches won't touch with a 10-foot pole. You know, being generous. I never heard a church preach about being generous. I heard about greed a lot, and I heard about how much of a sinner I was because I wasn't tithing, but I never heard that I should be generous and be joyful. That's how you redeem greed, is by being generous. That's how you redeem not giving to God, is by being generous. Pornography, all these different issues that every other church that I've ever been a part of is scared to touch, Calvary hits it with a 10-foot pole and knocks it out of the park. Because we're not afraid to speak the truth. And let me tell you right now, Calvary will never buckle on speaking the truth. We have five essential doctrines that are non-negotiable. We will not debate these things with you. We will not, we'll have discussion, but we're not going to entertain the thought of changing them because they are what we believe. Period. End of story. We also have four Core values, and those core values drive what the five essential beliefs teach us about how to do ministry. And so we will speak the truth day in and day out unapologetically, but we will do it in love with a focus on how to redeem your life, how God can take your mistakes and your mess-ups and turn it into something beautiful. That's the church I want to be a part of. And that's why our statement says that the ways we lead people to that life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ is through the love of his people and the power of his truth. It can't be one or the other. It has to be both. It has to be love and truth together. You can't have love without truth, and you can't have truth without love. Those two separated cannot work. You have to have them combined. And so those are what we stand on. Those are the truths that we will value constantly. But let me go back to the 35 to 40,000 people who don't know Christ in this community. Guys, I can tell you right now that I don't know all 35 to 40,000 of those people. But I bet if we took the 1,400 people that attend here on Calvary, that between the 1,400 that attend here, probably touch the lives of most of those 35 to 40,000. In other words, Guys, I want you to go all in. Calvary wants you to go all in with the mission that we live out as a church. We want you to adopt our mission as your mission. We want you to go, I'm going to live my life to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm going to do that through love and through telling the truth. Some of you are going, I'm not a preacher and I don't know the Bible very well. That's why we're building a new building, so it's easy for you to invite somebody to hear the truth. But let me break this down for a second, because some of you need to work on the love side of it first. Some of you, if you invited someone to church, they'd go, you're a jerk, and I would never go to somewhere you invited me to. And maybe you need to work on that. Maybe I need to work on that. But the fact is, is maybe you need to work on the love side of what you're doing. And some of you need to get the courage up once you've built those relationships to speak truth in their life and invite them to come to church. So my challenge to you is to go all in and think about two or three people in your life that you need to invite to church in the next coming months. I don't know if you need to put it down in your phone or you need to write it down on a piece of paper or in the inside flap of your Bible. I don't know. But think of two or three people that you need to invite to church. The other thing that I challenge you with is where does God want you to serve? Because every single one of us, when we stepped into a life-changing relationship with Jesus, we didn't just step into a relationship. We made him our Savior and our Master, our Lord. And he asks us to go and serve others as a result of that. Think about the parable of the talents. Think about what he says about being part of the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians 12. We're called to serve Christ. It's not enough to come in and sit in the pews on the weekend. We're called to be his hands and feet. We're called to be the salt. We're called to be the light in a world of darkness. And so how do you need to serve Christ in the context of your relationship with him? Do you love kids? 
You just love being around little ones and you just want to love on them. Why haven't you talked to Julie about volunteering in the children's ministry? You could come to serve in the children's ministry during the 930 service and then come and sit at the eleven. Do you love teenagers? <laughs> Nobody loves teenagers. What am I asking? <laughs> no, seriously though, there's some of you in this room who love teenagers. Some of you in this room are current youth volunteers. And that's awesome, but guys, I can tell you right now, it doesn't matter what your age or your stage of life is, guys, we've got teenagers in this town whose parents have pretty much abandoned them, and they have never experienced love from an adult. And they could, love, they could really use a grandma that would just love on them and just give them a hug, or a grandfather who would call them up and invite them to coffee or invest some time with them uh, at youth. If that's you, if you have a passion for teenagers, talk to Robert, our youth minister. If you don't like teenagers, don't talk to Robert, please. We don't need you in the youth ministry. Women, do you like doing girly things? I have no idea what that looks like, but do you like doing girly things? I don't know, does the women's ministry sit in crochet doilies or what? I don't know, I don't know, I'm not a girl, I've never been there. But ladies, are you, do you love that girl time? Do you love spending time with other women? Why haven't you started involving yourself in our women's ministry? Do you need to talk to Elaine or Leslie? Men, do you love your man cave? Do you love your shop? Do you love being around tools and guns and yeah? Why haven't you started volunteering and working with our men's ministry or our sportsmen's ministry or our, our Calvary Cares ministry where we go and do small home repairs for widows and the needy? We've got so many areas to serve and we have so many people that need to be served. And God has wired each and every one of us in this room for a specific way to go serve. So find your passions and your talents and go talk to that ministry. We need to be the hands and feet. Maybe your calling is not in Calvary. Maybe you have a passion for mothers who are hard on their luck and they're having a hard time and you need to go volunteer at Haven House and just love on some ladies who need some love. Maybe you just have a heart and compassion for those who are needy and you, you want to volunteer at interagency. I don't know. But we all need to be serving Christ somewhere. It's our calling. God has called every one of us to do something. So my challenge, just like I went all in in that football game, granted, I got beat up a little bit, and you might get beat up a bit, but go all in with the mission of Calvary. Find your place. Find those two or three people that you need to invite to church and find your passions and your gifts so that you can go serve Christ where he's called you and gifted you to do that. Find those things. Will you go all in with Jesus? Because I can guarantee you, Jesus went all in for you. It's time to give back. There's 35 to 40,000 people that we can give back to. Join me in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you so much for this time. And God, I pray that you would just open our minds and our hearts to what you're calling us to do. That you would reveal to our heart where we need to serve, who we need to invite, what we need to do to fulfill the mission that you've given us. So Lord, I thank you and I praise you. And I pray that you would change our lives so that we can lead others to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. We pray all these things in that name, the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.